Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Noah Mintz. I'm the event coordinator at the bookstore, and I'm thrilled to welcome Hermione Hobie and Katie Kitamura for a joint celebration of their new novels, Virtue and Intimacies, respectively. While we're eagerly awaiting uh, the return of in-person events, virtual ones like the one, like this one um, continue to be a joy. So I want to give a special thank you to our guests for joining us this evening and to all of you at home for tuning in. Um, now to some housekeeping, you should be able to see and hear our presenters, but they cannot see or hear you. So if you have any questions, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit them. We will be asking those at the end of the program, so please don't be shy. And again, that's the Q&A rather than the chat, just we have all of our questions in one place. Um, uh, there's also a, a chat button through which I'll be posting a link to buy tonight's books, which is of course very important. And one caveat for tonight's event is that we're all at the mercy of our home internet connections and server loads, especially those of us in New York uh, where there's a massive thunderstorm happening. So please bear with any technical issues that might arise and we will try to resolve them as quickly as possible. We've also scheduled a whole host of summer programming for you. So do head over to our website, communitybookstore.net and sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. One that I want to point out in particular is next Thursday, August 19th, we're thrilled to host Alexandra Kleeman for her new book, Something New Under the Sun, in conversation with Adam Dalva. That program is up on our website now and taking registrations. And finally, we've enabled Zoom's auto transcribe setting. So if your version of Zoom is up to date, you can hit the live transcription button at the bottom of your screen to enable closed captions. Now a little about tonight's guests and we'll get started. Hermione Hobie is the author of the novel Neon in Daylight which was twice listed as a New York Times editor's choice. Her writing has appeared in The New Yorker, Harper's Magazine, The Guardian, The New York Times, and Threes. Raised in London, she lives in Colorado. And Katie Kitamura's most recent novel, A Separation, was a finalist for the Premio Van Rizzori and a New York Times notable book. It was a best book of the year by um, over a dozen publications, translated into 16 languages, and is being adapted for film. Her two previous novels, Gone to the Forest and The Long Shot, were both finalists for the New York Public Library's Young Lions Fiction Award. A recipient of fellowships from the Lennon Foundation and Santa Maddalena, Katie has written for publications including The New York Times, The Guardian, Granta, Bomb, Triple Canopy, and Freeze. She teaches in the creative writing program at, N at NYU. So without any further ado, I'll hand it off to you to Hermione and Katie. Thank you so much. Thanks, Noah. Thank, Thank you, you so Noah. Much for Hi, Katie. Hi, Hermione. I wanted to uh, let everybody know because I feel like Hermione might be too considerate to do this, but it, she is in England right now, and I think it is currently 12.30 p.m. already, <laughs> so I just want to say a huge thank you um, no, for I, being here. As I, as I said to you in the, the green room, such as it was, <laughs> you are worth staying up for, and oh. it is a pleasure to be here, um, but yeah, if I, if I yawn, not because I'm bored. Yeah, it's just I, I, I won't. I promise I won't take it personally. Um, <laughs> I think what we're going to do is we're each going to read for a few minutes and then we'll yeah. chat and then we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully there'll be some questions um, from the audience. Thank you so much, Noah. Thank you to Community Books um, and Hermione. It's such a delight to be here. I've been looking forward to this ever since really it's been scheduled many, many months ago. Yeah. So it's so nice. It's so nice to talk to you. Do you know, I realize yeah. this is our fourth event together isn't that wild uh, yes it is it is yes that's totally yeah. correct because you <laughs> were so kind and you talked to me about my second book which must have been a long <laughs> time ago and I then not and it was a <laughs> but yeah that was that seems like a long time ago and now here we are and then we also talked about two really um wonderful uh kind of auto fictiony or memoir novels in translation Tobi Ditlevson. Copenhagen trilogy and then also Yuko Tsushima's Territory of Light and I actually wonder if that's something we should talk about later is the kind of I feel like we have very similar tastes in books and we are drawn to the same things and I yeah. I wonder if that that shows in, in our work and in the kind of connections between our books possibly yeah our books um, intimacies I, I know I know I had a I had a reading reading your book I felt like we were writing from the same with the same set of concerns and almost from yeah. the same kind of emotional and, and psychological state. And, and maybe that is a product of kind of having lived through the last four or five years, or maybe it's, you know, yeah. we share some of the same inputs in terms of our taste and our yeah. ways of thinking, yeah, but um, yeah. 
I am so tempted to just talk to you, but I feel like I'm going to get my reading out of the way. Because I said, <laughs> as, as I said to Hermione, we're I, uh, all eager to hear I'm you. Always, I'm always, ex- I, I love to get the reading out of the way. So I'm going to read first, I think, just a few pages from my book, Intimacies. Um, it's from the very start of the book. There's not too much that you need to know, as they say. Uh, the novel is about an interpreter who moves to The Hague to take a job working at uh, a war crimes tribunal. And this little section is actually a kind of story that's being told to her by somebody else. And I should say, if any of my Riverhead folk are here, I apologize that you're having to hear this passage again. I hope you'll (laughs) forgive me. Um, As I sat down at my desk, I recalled an anecdote that Amina had told me not long after I arrived at the court. It was a story I thought of often She had been tasked with interpreting for the accused, working in Swahili, and was briefly the only interpreter on the team with adequate fluency to perform the task. Her booth partner did not have a strong grasp on the language and said in private that her mind had drifted during the lengthy sessions. She listened to the originating English and French, but less closely to Amina's interpretation. But Amina herself was under considerable pressure. She was negotiating marathon sessions that were far longer than standard. She sat in the mezzanine level booth the accused position directly below her in the courtroom. He was still a young man, a former militia leader, wearing an expensive suit and slouched in an ergonomically designed office chair. He was on trial for hideous crimes and yet he simply looked, as he sat, sullen and perhaps a little bored. Of course, the accused are often in suits and in office chairs, but the difference lay in the fact that at the court, the accused had not merely been dressed up for the occasion, but were men who had long worn the mantle of authority conveyed by a suit or a uniform, men who were accustomed to its power. And they had a kind of magnetism, in part innate and in part heightened by the circumstances. The accused had an aura when they were brought to the Hague. We had heard a great deal about these men, and they were almost always men. We had seen photographs and video footage, and when they finally appeared in the court, they were the stars of the show. There was no other way of putting it. The situation staged their charisma. In the case of this particular man, he was not only young and undeniably handsome, but he had a dazzling air of command. Even without the aid of the courtroom, It was easy to see why and how so many people had obeyed his orders. But it was not even this, Samina explained. It was the intimacy of the interpretation. She was interpreting for one man and one man alone, and when she spoke into the microphone, she was speaking to him. Of course, she had known when she accepted the post in The Hague that the substance of the court would be darker than the United Nations, where she had previously been working. After all, the court concerned itself exclusively with genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, but she had not expected this kind of proximity. Although she was never face to face with the accused and was always safely ensconced behind the glass fronted interpreter's booth, she was constantly aware that she and the accused were the only two people in the courtroom who understood the language she was speaking. Over the course of these first sessions, Amina grew increasingly uneasy. The case involved a great deal of testimony regarding terrible atrocities and hour by hour, she carried this testimony from one language into another. She found herself on occasion struggling to control the tremor in her voice. She felt herself becoming entirely too emotional. But then, as quickly as the second day, and for reasons she didn't fully understand, a certain hardness overtook her. She discovered a new and acerbic tone, not exactly neutral, perhaps even reproachful. At one point, as she relayed the details of an embezzlement scheme, something that was morally questionable but a trifle compared to the other charges against the man, she found herself using a voice of cold disapproval as if she were a wife scolding a husband for some small domestic failing, neglecting to do the dishes, for example, rather than addressing his rampant infidelity or the fact that he had gambled away their life savings. At that moment, to her surprise, she saw the accused turn his head and look up in the direction of the interpreters. Until this point, he had sat almost entirely still, staring straight ahead, as if the proceedings had nothing to do with him, as if the entire matter was beneath him, although the result, Amina thought, was not the appearance of dignity. Rather, he looked like a sulky teenager being reprimanded for some infraction for which he refused to repent. There were perhaps half a dozen interpreters seated in the mezzanine level booths. It was unlikely that he would know which one of them was his. She had never before noted him observing them. She forced herself to keep her voice steady and focus on the job at hand. The last thing she wanted to do was get distracted. Nonetheless, she was unable to keep from surreptitiously watching the accused as his gaze swept the glass fronted booths. Perhaps feeling her eyes upon him, he suddenly stopped and looked directly at her, turning in his chair in order to do so. Amina couldn't help it. She stumbled over her words, 
apologize, nearly lost the thread of what was being said. He continued to stare at her, a grim expression of satisfaction settling into his handsome face, perhaps because he had succeeded in intimidating her and causing her to falter. And she felt at once, even through the glass wall dividing them, the totality of the man's will. Thanks. Over to you, Hermione. This is just so transfixing. It kind of um, feels nightmarish, which I need, obviously. <laughs> 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 oh. Jesus. Yeah, well, um, I want to talk about that more. It feels like <laughs> just to go straight into reading something else, which is totally so different. <laughs> um, I'll read for a bit and then we'll talk. <laughs> Sounds good. I'm going to do. Oh, I just lost you. Are you there? Oh, I think you're muted. Can you hear me? Shut up. I can hear you. I just muted myself. Okay. Is that, does, does that, does that make me disappear from the screen or is it just. No, it just, okay. I didn't know whether you were. Yeah. Okay. okay. So you're on the other side. <laughs> um, I too, am going to read from quite early on um, in the novel. Um, and uh, Luca, the narrator is recounting beginning an internship at a magazine. Um, I think that's all you need to know. The magazine came draped in its myths and rumors, the way a dowager might in her silks and furs, swathed in its inheritance with uncertain irony. In fact, the magazine actually was partly funded for decades by a batty old Viscountess, aging away in an actual castle in the actual Scottish Highlands, as well, it was said, as well as it was said, the CIA. Once every five years, the Viscountess opened her castle doors to the magazine's senior staff and a coterie of youngish writers selected as much for their presumed table manners and physical comeliness as for any literary talent. Obviously, interns weren't invited. I'd heard my attention instantly bright, tightening to the scandal of it, that the old lady was unsurprisingly racist that at one such dinner she'd commended a Philadelphia-born Asian-American writer on his excellent English. I knew I wasn't meant to know things like this, that they were an embarrassment, but to whom? It was as if the magazine were a person, which it kind of was. The new old world was edited by a figure with the indelible name of Byron Tancred. More than edited, dude was the magazine. He'd been there forever. You could pick him out in black and white photographs on the walls, a clean shaven, square jawed young American in slacks and a brilliantine side part, taking a knee in team photographs starred with grins, a clubhouse of affable men. In some pictures, there'd be one or two demure looking women perched in the background, straight backed and soberly clad in knee length tweed, a note of vague reproach in their eyes. I like to think they were trying to communicate some message to me, to this already unimaginable future in which I had just arrived. For a while, I couldn't work out whether I was meant to revere or ridicule Byron. He was a drinker, that was clear, but the light in which we interns were meant to view this was hazy and almost certainly irrelevant. People said he'd been punched by Mailer once, or maybe it was Thomas Pynchon, or maybe he'd been the puncher, not the punchy, accounts varied. It was something people alluded to knowingly, as if the vague fisticuffs were one of his life's central facts. Now that he's gone, I see that there was a decency to him, that the rest of it, the condescension or the leonine ego, or the storms of temper that left everyone silent and shaken, or the outlawed ideas about men and girls or that infamous time he referred to the ghetto didn't really affect the fact that he was a mostly decent man and maybe that's the troubling thing he seems to have been a good man anyway except in 2016 there wasn't really such a thing as a good man as far as I could tell this was our new doctrine with it must be said a lot of evidence behind it masculinity was toxic and masochists we turned our gazes to our screens to watch the president confirm it daily. We saw it in his dead black piggish eyes, the stark whiteness of their sockets within the caked orange of his face, his groping sausage hands. It was terrible how much I thought about the president's hands. He was the overlord of a white male underbelly of underlings, the incels and school shooters and 4chan trolls. 
I had no appetite for gunmen's manifestos. The sight of swastikas made me sick and frightened, and I liked and loved women. But nonetheless, guilty until proven innocent, I walked around cowed by my own cis white maleness while wondering if it might somehow benefit me in the world to nurture whatever queerness I had in me. On subway platforms, I caught myself staring at posters for a shockingly popular TV show that declared in an adamantine font, all men must die. All, all seem like a lot. I wanted badly to be good. I wanted desperately to be liked. It was easy to confuse the two. Start there. <laughs> That's unmute. such a. Well, I've I've unmuted myself. That was that's such a wonderful passage, and um, I guess I wanted to start by asking you a little bit. Um, one of the novels that I read during the pandemic, and I've been kind of pressing on everybody, was is Anna Segre's Transit. Which, do you know oh, this novel? No. It's really, ex it's this really extraordinary book that she um, about a group of refugees who are trying to get out of occupied France and they need to get the right transit visas. And it's a kind of, I've taken to describing it as a kind of thriller of bureaucracy. But the point is, one of the reasons I find the novel so extraordinary is because she wrote it during the war and it was actually published in 1944. So she herself fled France. She got on a, a boat, she arrived in Mexico and she wrote the novel very quickly shortly after that. And the novel is so clear eyed, so lacking in sentimentality. It's so precise in the way it renders these very large events that are literally taking place as she wrote them. And I, yeah. I remember thinking that is so hard to do. And that's obviously what you've also done with virtue is you're writing about things, I, I assume, as they were kind of unfolding around you and the kind of, yeah. I guess I wanted to ask how you both capture the texture of what's happening, but also get the kind of requisite distance, I suppose, because there's also distance written into the structure of the novel yes. as well. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thanks for such a beautiful question. And before I answer it properly, I just wonder if this amazing sounded novel, amazing sounding novel is um uh what the film of the same name is yes um, yes it is it is so but he but schlingen's uh, not, um yeah what is his name uh, uh, christian petzold he made petzold, this really yeah. interesting decision where he just updated the locations without any explanation so it's yeah. as if it's happening right now ish right but you're and like it, this is clearly occupied yes France, yes right now and yes yeah god that yeah. film so wonderfully yeah um disorienting for that it's, it's really wonderful and it's one of those occasions where you think the film is its own creature it's so much in the yeah. spirit of the book but it's very much oh its own. I, I am so grateful to know that that movie is um, based <laughs> on a novel which I'm now going to read oh I think you'll um, I think you'll love it yeah it sounds fabulous like, yeah. I never heard of it um yeah uh but yeah writing about the world as it's happening <laughs> felt, felt really hard and um uh, I think that that is why there is this, so the, the framing, um, you know, is that Luca is narrating 2016 and then into 2017 from the vantage of our future, but his present. And I think there was something, I mean, that was appealing to me, I think for a few reasons, some more noble than others, or rather some less noble than others. Um, I think in part, it was just like, I'm, I'm sort of drawn to a sort of elegiac tone. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think it was, it was a kind of wishfulness in that the, you know, that, that time through which I was writing, and it's not like this has ceased to be true, <laughs> seemed, it, it seemed like we were, you know, we were all like tyrannized by the, the present and by, you know, the tweets and the way um, that just seemed, so much news happened in yeah. one day. Um, I just read Sally Rooney's wonderful new novel and she has this great line. Uh, one of her characters writes an email to a friend and the character is a novelist and she's writing about the discontinuous nature um, of the present and how, um, you know, things feel, it's like we all know where we were when such and such a thing happened. And so to leave it out of a novel seems bizarre. So I want to talk to you about this and, and your novel, which is kind of Brexity, I think, as I yes. understand it. Yeah. Um, but, but I think I was, um, you know, I wanted to believe in a time when this 
this moment, this presidency would be, uh, you know, the past, as in uh, I wanted, um, I wanted that distance. So I kind of, I guess I, you know, it was like a, I faked the distance by having yeah. him narrate it from the future, but, you know, just to kind of, in an unseemly way, like psychoanalyze myself, I also wanted to believe in this future in which we hadn't utterly slid into a fascist yeah. dictatorship under this abomination of a person. Um. <laughs> I, I mean, did you find that the writing helped, I mean, helped order those? I mean, I, I, I felt exactly the same as you, and I, I felt like I was stuck in a relentless present and I also can nothing ever felt like it was being fully contextualized into a history somehow because it was just mm -hmm. constantly you know fragments would come up and then they'd go away and you just couldn't really yeah. connect the dots somehow and I, I guess I wondered was did writing uh, allow you to do that in some way yeah. because it feels very much you, you know it's very persuasive this kind of elegiac beautiful voice that you create for Luca and the sense of a character who's was trying to puzzle out exactly what happened mm. during that summer some time ago. Yeah. Well, thank you for saying that. I mean, when you use the phrase connect the dots, I yeah. thought of the, the beautiful consonants of your novel and how, um, you know, for me at least, this is like, you know, writing fiction is the way I like order the world and yeah. stay, you know. <laughs> The way I survive, not just yeah. 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 and or both. Um, but you know, in that time, it was like this book was a companion, and of course, it was it was to do it is to do with what was happening then. Um, so in a way, it's like the opposite of escapism. It's oh. trying to engage, you know, it was trying to engage um, with those those years. Um, but it was like it felt to me like a way of redeeming things and. Um, and making them, you know, making a narrative out of something that refused narrative. And I think, you know, you touched on that, the, the nature of tweets and, you know, the, like this, every, everyone is talking about something one day on Twitter or even one morning yeah. and then yeah. by the yeah, afternoon yeah. it's just forgotten. And there's yeah. just like this, um, this amnesia and this like relentless, um, you know, shifting of attention. Um, but I'm, I'm so curious to hear how you wrestle with this and when, at what point, how did you know that this was set? I mean, it's, it's to me, it's like, I almost, it's like not a hugely important feature of the book when it's set. And I yeah. guess it's one of the strengths of the book that it's, um, it feels like, uh, you know, you have made, you have made a world unto itself that is about these people and their relations, which isn't to say it's not very much engaged with, you know the much bigger things at play in this world but but yeah how, how did you how did you wrestle with these sorts of yeah, problems it, i mean it, it's it's interesting because it's not in any way explicitly a novel that is about the last administration and as, as you say it's it's quite precisely placed kind of in the run-up to the brexit vote um and it and it's pre pre the 2016 election it's kind of set in in that kind of, uh, in the kind of winter moving into the summer. Um, yeah. But it felt very much like I was writing it in response to what was happening around me because it's a novel that's really for me about implication and it's a novel about complicity. And it's, it's a book that is trying to think about how we are implicated in the systems that we are part of, even if we don't feel ourselves to be, or even if we feel that we stand in opposition to them, the fact that it is still very, very hard to not still benefit from those systems or be implicated by them. Um, yeah. You know, and it comes all the way down to the kind of language that we use and, and, and all of it. So it was a novel that was trying to think through that. Um, and and then and and then I think it's a novel that's interested in the possible collapse of these kind of idealistic, big projects. You know, the European <laughs> Union, the International right. Criminal Court, the idea of right. international criminal justice. All these ideals that I think are are feel so central to my understanding of 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 a functioning society. You know, have really come under under fire. So I think, in a funny way, it was the the kind of the events of it are really in the run up to to the kind of last four or five years, but feel very the approach feels very infused from my own experience. I also think that you know everything that happened 
in 2016 was of course not a surprise all of it was all there and growing mm -hmm. and you know it's a little bit like with the recent spate of anti-asian hate crimes that's not come out of nowhere it's not even come out of only the trump administration you know there's such a long history and i think it's when you start to kind of bed down and unpick those things that something even if it's taking place before the kind of explosion can still have a lot of the same anxieties um in yeah. some way but i mean the the question of you know it's really as you say a handful of paragraphs even that are that really nail the time period and part of that came out of a kind of desire to make the action around the court as precise as possible you know i i didn't name the figure the kind of figure who's who is being prosecuted because i felt like i didn't have the right to tell that story and i didn't want to presume to tell a story um, that i didn't feel I was in a position to tell but at the same time I you know didn't want to fall into the trope of kind of inventing a, a dictator figure so it's very very closely based on Lahore Bagbo Cote d'Ivoire and so the timeline of events it felt important to kind of say when in the history of this institution this particular yeah. trial was taking place yeah um I mean I was you know it's I I've written I feel like I've written a number of books that are set in in Europe, but I've used American characters, which has always been kind of my out for not totally, um, I think, getting all the nuances of a particular place. And it's very much like I have a, my novels often fe feature an outsider who's kind of analyzing the culture. You've done something really incredible where you are writing a thoroughly American character, not simply in terms of voice or vocabulary, which I think is also hard enough, but also just in terms, it feels like Luca feels like a kind of incredibly American creature of self-invention. I just wondered, you know, this is a kind of a nerdy craft question, but how, how is, is, is it hard? Is it just tapping into a voice? Are you going back and, and adjusting language? How, how do you conceive yeah. of both character and voice? Oh, yeah, I guess, I mean, Luca was just that welcome psychosis of a voice in my head. That, that's sort of how it began. <laughs> um you know with with things to say um so he just I mean it's you know it's um it's very much like some revisionism if I'm like he just appeared fully formed and you know it's like <laughs> obviously there was a lot of labor and despair and, and involved, involved in them um, you know creating the thing um I mean you you know you said you write outsiders and I actually think that's um mm. That's kind of, yeah. you know, that's, I mean, you know, it's funny because we, we mentioned this a bit over email, like, you know, writing different characters. And then um, I was thinking, I was thinking today, it's funny to be in the UK now, which of course, you know, <laughs> is where I'm from. But I just, I, you know, I was on the tube today, which by the way, I don't recommend. And um, <laughs> I was just like fascinated by hearing English voices and, you know, thinking like these are so different to American voices and in a way they're familiar to me, but of course they've become exotic because mm -hmm. I haven't lived here for 11 years. So I think I've, I've written an, this American character, this American man, um, because, uh, it, I mean, you know, this will sound like a contradiction, but partly because I still remain a sort of tourist in the US. I mean, it's my home, but it's like, I think I have some of the benefits of like, you know, it's easier to be an observer when it's not your own, when you, have, when you haven't sort of grown up with it and taken it for mm -hmm. granted. Um, but also just, you know, I've, I've lived there a long time. Um, but I, you know, I did like, I had, um, you know, my, my partner who is American, um, read and say like I don't know like little little adjustments yes. of language um in terms of what uh and you know I kind of cheated in that in having had Luca have a year at Oxford because yes <laughs> yes, yes. Like a little yes. bit of Anglo inflection but but I love that you um you you sort of suggested like this uh, I think you said like a self-fashioned American yes. man because that was something very much in my head I had this idea that he was sort of self-narrativizing uh, because he had 
formed his sense of himself through you know kind of canonical American novels about yes finding themselves yes yes um yeah I, I guess I mean he's he's a character who it, it feels very significant that he's male for not simply because of the kind of topicality is a wrong word but the kind of interest of looking at a male character particularly during this period but also because he is drawing from everything from Gatsby onwards probably further back to kind of figure out who he is and I realized that I as I was describing my own characters as outsiders and the way that kind of allows them to be almost anthropologists of a culture Luca is exactly the same he he's completely an outsider who is trying to understand the customs of this world and he's not really understanding them possibly but that's kind of what allows you know I was thinking in that passage that you read there's such lovely precision and detail and it you know every detail instantly kind of evokes exactly the world you know that is being described Um, and of course that's what Luca notices because he's an outsider I mean if he was of that world he wouldn't you know, none of that would be of note, but it's it's actually yeah. because he's an outsider that right. You know, re- rereading your wonderful novel today, I was struck by the similarity. It's like your character too feels like not really at home anywhere, and Lucas says like you know like something like how do I lay claim? How does a person lay claim to a life? Yes. I think both yeah, both of them have this sense of in betweenness or slight remove, um, and I think um, yeah, I mean. Someone, someone asked me uh, recently, you know, they, they were like, well, you've sort of written two coming of age stories and like, why are you drawn to that? And I guess my answer was something along the lines of, you know, characters who know themselves entirely and who are completely yeah. confident and assured in their identity just makes a very boring fiction. Like there's no yes. discovery to be had. And I think one of the things that is so compelling about your novel is that there is this blend of like surety and self-possession in your in, in her voice, um, combined with this this sense of being adrift and um, being this shrewd observer of other people, um, you know, and and, and slightly um, sort of chimerical in in her nature. Um, I guess I I'm interested in, and this is tenuously linked to this. Um, translation or rather like what I means the figure of the the translator because this is your your second novel to mm-hmm. feature mm-hmm. a translator um yeah and uh I mean it seems to me it's well I I, I want to hear your thoughts but, but it seems to me that translating is this really intriguing blend you know fictively very rich of the the precise and the interpretive Mm -hmm. and of course you play this out so beautifully in the novel with this character who is translating for this person who's committed terrible crimes but but tell me well I guess I'm curious how how the figure of the translator what that means to you how that's changed why Mm -hmm. why it compels you Mm -hmm. I I mean I, I think there are kind of two two prongs to it in a way I I'm interested in the kind of linguistic, kind of the almost formal linguistic uh, capacities of, of, of translation and interpretation as a motif. And I think, you know, it's it's kind of in a separation a little bit, um, but it's much more in intimacies and there are actual scenes where I think the kind of way, the, the flow of language between people is, or at least I've tried to kind of track it out quite precisely. Um, but I think I'm also really interested in characters who uh, who do not center the narrative on themselves, who who yeah. operate in a mode of deflection, you yeah. know, who 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 are who who do show what they're looking at rather than themselves, and and thinking about what that means, both in terms of crafting voice, but very much in this novel. In terms of thinking about what it means for for this character to to exist in this state of deflection and passivity, and, and is it actually possible to st- to move out of that when she starts to feel the kind of limitations of that? So I mean, you know, they're characters who I would say are um, operating from the margins and not really inside a particular social structure for a variety of reasons, and they're 
figures who are not comfortable with authorship. You know, they're, they're, mm -hmm. they, they're, they're, they're comfortable with observation and judgment and interpretation, but actually laying claim to a narrative and to kind of telling the story is something that's not, they're not comfortable mm -hmm. with. Um, and so obviously that kind of creates interesting fictional tensions. Like how do you tell a story when you have a kind of reluctant storyteller? What, how does that change the register of yeah. how a story works um, in a piece of fiction? Yeah. So that, yeah. I mean, I was actually thinking when I, cause, because I realized we'd both written these novels that as you say, are about outsiders looking in. I mean, I think some of this and about a kind of layering of cultures, I think some of this does have to do with the fact that we've both spent considerable amounts of time in countries that are not where we're from. And, yeah. and you know, I think, I think in some ways, I, I, I think virtue is such an American novel, but I think it's in some ways it is exact, I mean, obviously, uh, not obviously, but my, my husband Hari is also an English novelist who writes a lot about America. And I do think yeah. there's something about that kind of having one step, one foot on another shore that allows that kind of quite sharp analysis yeah. of the culture at, at hand. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was, I mean, sorry, this answer's a bit glib and then I'll be more serious, but I was <laughs> kind of, I have been reading reviews that Ben, my partner's been I'm calling him the Queen's Taster. He's been like reading them for oh, me. Okay. <laughs> anything important. Um, and I should say, you know, this isn't like, I mean, it sounds very grand. I just can't read reviews because I, oh. it's not that I, uh, it's not that I think I'm above reading them. I just have to like preserve the space. Mm, but yes. he, he said there was one which called me a, like a British born Coloradan author. And it's like, so it really tickled me that I'm now a Coloradan <laughs> author. And I said to Ben, you know, you've got to write like a novel about a young British woman now that I've written a novel about a young Coloradan man. Anyway. Um, what were you talking about? Uh, are you are you now? Yeah. Can I ask? Is that is that landscape now part of what you're bringing to the? Because I, the other th the thing I wanted to, or one of the many things, but one of the things I wanted to ask you about is place because you're really known for writing, especially in New York City, with incredible detail and and evocation and precision, but also a lot of feeling in a really beautiful way that for people who love this city means a lot but I think you 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 also are doing that with Maine and and I guess I just wondered you know you're, you're writing place in a, in terms of how it conditions behavior as well like you're not just yeah. saying this is what it looks like around me but you're saying this is how place is affecting and conditioning people's the way they act the way they behave the people that they become um yeah. so yeah I mean you don't have to talk about Colorado because I know it's not like a major, major, but it is kind of because it's where Luca is, is from. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. I mean, I guess the funny thing is like, you know, New York, I find inspiring and also like very much not conducive to work. And Colorado, I love and find very yeah. conducive to work, but not, I mean, it sounds awful to say not inspiring. I just mean like, um, you know, I love taking long hikes, but I don't then feel like I want to write about the beauty of the pine trees, beautiful though right. they may be. I guess I'm, you know, I'm sort of preoccupied with um, people. So yeah, there's just that, that, you know, ridiculousness of, um, I don't know, it's actually yeah, hard to work in New York. Um, mm. Yeah, um, I just wanted to, um, uh jump back a moment if I may mm -hmm. um you were just so interesting it was just so interesting talking about um you know outsiderness and kind of rereading um the novel today um this line I found this line so arresting in which the narrator says something like uh she's disgusted to find disgusted to find myself so permeable and I wonder I just that just made me think about how perhaps a degree of permeability is requisite for a writer of fiction and whether yes. it's not to be too personal, but whether you yes. feel yourself to be quite permeable and whether that's something you need to preserve, but whether yes. that comes with any degrees of moral uneasiness, not that yes. it should, but I think the thing about being just an observer, and I think this is playing out with both our narrators, mm -hmm. is are you then a bystander? Are you then complicit? Is your inaction you know, as much a crime as yeah. um, 
an act of crime. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What, yeah. I mean, I, I, I was thinking about that a, a lot for sure. And I was thinking about, you know, what does it mean when we say bear witness? Um, yeah. Yeah. Because I think witnessing is a very complicated thing. And I think we all bring our own subjectivity and our own histories all of that, our own biases mm. to the act of witnessing. And I think it's it's very hard to be a neutral witness. It's very hard to be an accurate witness. And it's very, you know, you know beyond the kind of complexities of, of, of what it means to not take action, what it means to witness rather than take action. You know, obviously witnessing is a kind of action, but I think the need to be aware of, of, of the filter that you bring to that, it was really on my mind when I was writing this, book because one of the journeys that the central character makes is she kind of understands that you know initially she considers herself a neutral kind of instrument of the court and then eventually she understands that actually she's bringing so much of herself and her own personal history and and her racial history and yeah. um that it's there's no kind of pure subjective point you know there's no zero degree subjective point from which you can objectively observe anything yeah. um I mean, the question of permeability, I think for me is, is linked to something that I'm quite, for better or worse, wary of in writing, which is the question of kind of empathy, which I think, you know, empathy, and especially, you know, I have children, I have a son, we're very much, you know, this anxiety about bringing up empathetic boys and, mm -hmm. and you know, empathy rightly is, is held up as a kind of great virtue, not to borrow your title. Um, but I also think one of the things that my character experiences is the limitations of empathy or, or the moments when empathy actually puts you somewhere that is morally questionable so what yeah. happens to her is she experiences such a kind of closeness with this person that she's interpreting for that she feels herself permeable to him to his point of view to his arguments and that feels to her like a very ethically questionable position to be in yeah. I mean the question of permeability and and writing fiction is is definitely something that I I think about. I mean, I you know I think about what what point of view I'm writing from. Mm -hmm. I think about what it means to be inside of that head for a very very mm -hmm. long time. I mean, like you said, Luke. You know, when you said that Luca's voice kind of came to you, you know what? I, I actually don't. I, I don't think there are any ethical questions for 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 you to inhabit this this kind of male. Characters, no, point, are, point of views, but like, but like, what you know, what is it? What I guess, like, but what, what are also the kind of psychological, yeah, what is a way of being inside that particular head for this long period of time? All those questions, I think, you, you do have to come up against when you're writing in some form Absolutely. or another, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, I, I sort of noticed that <laughs> the, the project <laughs> I embarked on when I'd finally finished this one, which is, you know, um, it privileges, <laughs> I mean, it, it is in the voice of a young straight white man, you know, a, a, well, in the, as in the bit I just read, a kind of yeah. understandably maligned <laughs> category. Um, and I, you know, last summer I was thinking so much about the politics of perspective, and um, uh, I'd read um, Sylvia Townsend Warner, um, who has this wonderful novel called *The Corner That Held Them*, which is about it's like over hundreds of years, and it's there is no main character, and mm -hmm. you know she was um, a, a real communist, and I was like, this formally is so interesting politically, and yes. in that there is no you know, we, we associate the novel um, as a kind of bourgeois form. It's like the individual. And so the, you know, I found myself trying to write this short story, which was from multiple perspectives. Um, and, and um, uh, you know, the, it's from the perspectives of a bunch of migrants, um, like arriving on the English shores in the dinghy and the people on the beach, and it's a nudist beach. Anyway, um, so yeah, these these questions are, um are troubling um uh and i but in, in terms of what you were saying about the way that the narrator finds herself in this very mm. uneasy intimacy yeah i was thinking of the way this happens in in fiction itself um 
I mean, this doesn't really apply to, to your character, but so often, you know, just the, there is just, um, I'm, I'm trying to think of a good phrase for it, but the, the sort of immediate sympathy one feels for the, the protagonist, whoever they may be, yeah. in the way that you're like weirdly rooting for them. Yes. And I think there's something of this in your book too. Yes. It's like, you know, this man is um, palpably, inarguably, despicable yes. release yes. committed yes. unconscionable crimes yes. but because she's sort of because of this intimacy she's like maybe even like at some level weirdly rooting for him. yes I mean that that really came out of a conversation that I had with an interpreter um, who was mm -hmm. working at the ICC who said that he had he had been tasked with working very much one-on-one -on -one with with somebody and then became attached to him without really understanding how it happened and yeah. um and then and then finding that when he was found not guilty um on the technicality let's say mm -hmm. that he was relieved and that was such a disturbing moment for him to find yeah. himself flooded with relief that a person he fully believed was a war criminal would be would yeah. be released um mm -hmm. i mean i think i i i i, I don't know if in the chat I'm being told to hop over to questions, but I mean, one thing I guess I, I just quickly will ask you about, which I think is again a thread, and I and I love that there's so many connective points between our books, but is about charisma because mm. obviously I, I feel like you know that's something that I think appears in both novels. You know, you have the incredibly charismatic um, couple that in some ways are are almost at the heart of the novel, they're not quite, but of Paula and Jason and also Zara as well. You have mm -hmm. this kind of trio of, of characters who, whose charisma stands almost in opposition to Luca's extreme, almost transparency and permeability. And I think similarly yeah. for me, I had a lot of, you know, there are these kind of monstrous, charismatic men in, in my book. Um, I mean, I guess one one thing I'll ask is I have a character in my book who's who's a bookseller and he's a kind of raconteur and he was so much fun for me to write to the point yeah. that when my partner read the first draft, he said, you've got to cut this material because you are having so much fun <laughs> writing this character that it's like it's cannibalizing the book. And you're like, this is not about this character, but like I just was, I was having, so I cut out like loads and loads, like chapters and chapters about this one one character because I just became kind of I kind of He's fell in love with him yeah completely and I just yeah. wondered if like and I felt like Paula and, and Jason as well and Zara they're so finely drawn and they are are kind of seductive and I wondered if anything like that had also happened to you <laughs> no completely I mean I just like you know I have to like fancy to use an English term Paula and, <laughs> and Jason to kind of write them. Um, mm. uh, yeah, I think Luca's admiration for Zara is something different and a bit more noble perhaps. Um, but yeah, it was, I mean, it was a fine balance. It's like, um, you know, you don't, you want to be seducing, not seduced. Yes. You know? <laughs> yes. And that's always a tricky thing to make sure you're doing um, because otherwise it's just kind of self-indulgent and it's like, you're not doing your you're not giving your reader what they need I think but I mean with Zara and Jason uh, sorry uh, Paula and Jason that the couple the slightly older glamorous sexy couple that he becomes um, very taken with um, it was yeah it was a tricky balance of making them um, you know alluring but this idea of you know, um, beauty seeming a little bit uh, suspicious or <laughs> decadent and whether beauty can coexist with duty and, um, uh, you know, what, what its uses are. And of course it is useless, mm -hmm. you know, arguably, but we're so drawn to it and we mm -hmm. need it and whether that's a shameful thing. So yeah, all this was playing mm -hmm. <laughs> through my mind and I really, you know, I, I felt sort of enthralled by your descriptions, particularly of female beauty. Um, you know, Gabby, I have this spoiler, but Gabby, when she goes up, is just so <laughs> soigné and, um, and there's just such pleasure in reading those. Yeah. Um, we know that it is, it's a more, it's a complicated pleasure. I yeah. think you do that so well. 
um thank you i i i feel like we should um turn we should to do the questions. questions i did i mean though and i'm not going to ask this but i just want to flag i also we have the connective thing of, of artwork appearing in our yeah like invented artwork which, which we didn't get a chance to discuss but i do want to talk about it um with you yeah. at some point should we just start at the at the top um yeah let's do that i guess a question from sarah what has become the new normal for each of your writing routines and habits do you want to I, answer or I, I can try and answer yeah <laughs> um i guess like trying to make peace with very poor productivity <laughs> I have not got much work done these last 18 months. Um, what has become my new normal? I mean, you know, the pandemic actually changed. Um, I, I was aware that our lives um, changed less than so many of our yeah. friends because, you know, we were already working from home. Um, we'd have kids. We we're already like taking long walks. And <laughs> yes. um, so it, it wasn't a, I mean, psychically it was a huge change, but in terms of day to day, it wasn't as as drastic for us as for so many people I know. Um, but how about you, Katie? What's your new normal? I mean, I have to say that I feel my writing practice has become so fragmented anyway in the last Mm. eight years uh, I mean essentially since I had had children but you know sometimes yeah. I, I look back and and and, oh, and also I think just with publication and, and other things you know you look back at the calendar and you can count the number of full writing days you have and it's actually not that yeah. many and I've really resigned myself to feeling okay about that I feel like in terms of because I don't have a choice but I feel like in terms of I don't know if this is at all useful to anybody but but for me I found that what stabilizes me and what keeps me from getting depressed is reading. And that's actually what makes me feel like a functioning writer is, is not necessarily writing a thousand words a day, which, you know, is, is kind of back in the day would be my normal goal. It's really just reading and reminding myself that I'm interacting with the text and I'm, you know, that is so much a big part of my process. So that is something that I've been able to do with so much pleasure during the pandemic it's really mm. kept me stable i would say um but i have not reached a new normal that's terribly <laughs> terribly um productive yet either yeah. although you started yeah. something new so that is kind of yeah. Yeah. yeah i mean yeah let's we'll see i don't yeah. know too early but yeah reading for me it took me a long time to make peace with this but i remember talking to you years and years ago and you you said with like um you know a tone of kind of um like you were scandalized by yourself you were like all I did today was read and I remember being like that's our job like, <laughs> no it is it is it really is and I and I feel like that's something you know when I'm I'm teaching I feel like you know letting people know that there are kind of like different rhythms to your work yeah. and it's not I mean of course like there are many writers who get up and they you know, when they write a thousand words and then they, if they finish the novel, they start the next novel on the same day. I can't even remember if that was Philip Roth or who, somebody does something like that. Yeah. But, you yeah. know, I also remember, you know, a lot of my influences are not from, from, from the book world. And I remember a friend of mine who's a filmmaker saying about Michael Clark, the choreographer, mm. that he would spend days in bed, not doing anything. And he would just say, it's just a fallow period. And those periods are also yeah. important. And I think, yeah. You know, that is when it's ready it, it it you know there's a lot of cooking that you are not necessarily Definitely. yeah I mean I tell myself that like you know a lot of the writing happens when I'm whatever you know wandering about or sitting on a train and thinking and yeah. you know or yeah. like observing a conversation happening yeah. or like, you know eavesdropping on people on the tube today <laughs> that's all writing <laughs> So I tell myself. I'm going to ask a, <laughs> another question from Kiki that says, could you please both talk about the original nuggets of inspiration that led to your novels, the first thoughts, ideas, questions that caught your attention and how you decided to pursue and interrogate them further? Did you know that they could or would mm. lead to these novels? It's such a nice yeah. question. Yeah, that's a great question. Go for it. I want to um, hear <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I have... For the last two books, not so much the other ones, but the last two books, I've had very clear sense of when the first idea of the book came to me. And it was it's worryingly long ago. So like with a separation, yeah. I think, which came out in 2017, I think the first inkling of that novel came around 2006 or seven. Wow. And with Intimacies, it was in 2009 when I heard um, 
Charles Taylor, the former president of Liberia, speaking on the radio, and it was mm -hmm. such a kind of troubling and morally complicated experience. And there was such a kind of performative element to it and the sense of language being manipulated. I immediately thought there was something for fiction there. Um, but I find I have, I can trace the moment that I, it occurred to me. And then it's usually almost five years later mm. that I then sit down and I start to work on it. And, mm. and I, I mean, my feeling is that I can only really work on, I can only write a book that has haunted me for at least that long. And I know it's got yeah. that kind of essential, um, you know, it's stuck around in my head long enough and it doesn't let go. And then that's the book I, I mm -hmm. end up writing. How yeah. about you with virtue? I think it's more for me. I mean, you know, this is this one's only the second, so I feel a little silly like pronouncing with anyone any authority on how it always is for me. But you know, with the two, <laughs> two that it, is it, two is a lot, <laughs> and I, and I feel like what? your word count is probably like the same as mine in total across <laughs> four books. Let's not get numerical. <laughs> <laughs> um. I, for me, it's like the novel just becomes the companion and the way of seeing the world. So it's mm. kind of receptive to things as they're happening. You know, it's like the novel becomes my frame for the world. Um, so, you know, the kernel for me was just this voice of Luca and the idea of the, of the other three main characters, Paula and Jason and Zara. And then it's, so I, I think I probably sort of begin with character and voice rather than you know, ideas. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> there are ideas. In it. it was not an entirely vacuous novel. But um, did Luca come into being with those three characters constellated around? Like, is who he is really fundamentally a person who observes and admires and has complicated yeah. feelings about these? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think I think those people seem to come together at, you know at the same time but yeah. but I suppose that you know the backdrop to answer um Kiki's wonderful question the, the backdrop for me was very much this question of art like what is the mm -hmm. point of art how can we defend art when the world is in this state of emergency and you know it just seems uh you know um absurd if not indefensible to be you know writing made up stories you know or shouldn't I just be on the streets like mm. you know uh doing something that feels more of, of greater sort of political utility and you know I hope I mean the fact that I, I wrote a novel to answer the question is in itself the answer you know it's like I, I must believe in fiction to spend four years you know trying to do it um so yeah I guess that was that was sort of one of the things playing in the background um and, and yeah, and I guess, you know, I touched on this before, the, this, this way in which we, we, we sort of have like a, a double, the phrase, the good life has a double meaning, mm -hmm. um, as in both like a life of pleasure and beauty and family, um, and this is sort of the small world, and then the good life in terms of how to lead an ethical life and a politically, mm -hmm. civically yeah. responsible, respectable life, and how hard it seems to unite those two. Yeah. And maybe no one gets to have both. Yeah. Um, I am conscious that we are- Okay, we yes, I've, we've actually just been sent a message to say we can ask one more question, so. <laughs> Shall we, we there's uh, Emmy. Hi, oh. Emmy Francis. Um, can I put this one to you, Katie? Um, how are you both reaching for an internationalist readership? simultaneously in geography but also sensibility what do you think about fiction produced within nationalistic arenas including the US you are both so worldly exclamation point oh <laughs> thanks Emmy <laughs> thank you Emmy I love that question do you um do you want to answer or I, don't. <laughs> I mean it's a wonderful <laughs> question but I want to hear what you have to say um I mean I I read I I read primarily fiction in translation um mm. it is my is mostly what I read. And I, I, um, I think that really informs how I write. It probably even informs um, the kind of syntax of my sentences because mm, so much of what I've, I'm, I'm in, in, inhaling, you know, sentences work differently in different languages. You know, there are different rules. And I think a lot of that, it, it comes from reading so much work that isn't originally written in, in English. Um, I mean, I, 
I, I can get very involved in trying to uh, understand what is happening within a national literature and reading, you know, if I love mm -hmm. a writer, I read the writers that can't, are constellated around them, the writers that influence them, and that kind of opens up into a kind of moment when you can feel like you can see a kind of how schools of thought and writing come into being. And that's very, very fascinating to mm. me. I mean, I'm always, it's also very interesting to see how readers respond to your work in, in different countries. And it's, I, I don't find it mm. at all predictable what is, what's, where your sensibility feels like it's aligned with, you know, with what country. Um, mm. And I also think, you know, at least for me, I mean, it's, it's obviously, I, I write about translators because I, I, I admire their work so much. And I, I feel like I owe a lot of my writing style and career to translators because I've, yes. you know, when I, when I read Javier Marias, I'm re reading Margaret mm -hmm. Neil Costa, or when I read Olga Tokarczuk, I'm reading Jennifer Croft. And, yeah. and similarly, like when somebody reads me in another language, they are reading my translator, you know, that's, that's yeah. a co-author of the book. And so I think, yeah. you know, so much of my writing for me is about kind of moving through double two layers of consciousness like with this book with the interpretation it's like a sentence that travels from one person to another person I hadn't really thought about this until this lovely question but that's exactly how I read as well everything I read has passed through you know every sentence has been written twice mm, I mean by, by the author and the yeah yeah what about you of course, of course every sentence means something you know, there's like an endless translation and that every yes. reader takes something different. From yes, 100%. That to 100%. me, you know, I, I can, I don't know, I feel like that's, that to me is so magical. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, like you, it's, you know, some of my favorites are people who do not write in English. I had a, a real spate last year of re reading um, Marie Indie, who I don't know. Mm -hmm so wonderful um mm -hmm. yeah i really loved her and now of course i'm just you know blanking on on all my reading well we talked about yeah i mean you and i have talked about the wonderful two of her did and um uh um uh oh my god territory of light oh my god you go oh, tsushima thank you go yeah, tsushima yeah 32 <laughs> a.m in my defense oh i know oh my god <laughs> you have to let you go sorry but to, to me it is um yeah, it is so important. I mean, America, I think, is particularly guilty of myopia and, you know, a kind of exceptionalism, both like we're the best and we're the worst. And so to break out of, you know, uh, America's self-referentiality and, and read things from all over the world is, yeah, very important to me. Yeah. Um, Katie, this has been Great. such a pleasure. Thank this you. This has been so fun. Thank you for staying up so late. Thank you for all these incredible questions. I feel so sad that we didn't I know, I'm sorry get we to all of them. Oh. I know, I could but. listen to you answer these questions all night, but um, it's already been all night for Hermione, so it's probably <laughs> fit to uh, log off. Um, thanks again so much to both of you for a really wonderful, thoughtful conversation. It was uh, absolute pleasure. And those of you at home, please do remember to purchase a copy of Hermione and Katie's books from Community Bookstore if you can. And we hope to see you at another virtual event soon. Thank you so much for joining us. And have a great evening, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank Hermione. you.